Hi, good morning. Um, I wanted to thank uh, Ewan and the uh, team for putting such a fantastic set of talks together and for inviting me to participate. Uh, I'm going to talk about the perils, but also the promise of big data uh, using imaging genetics and Alzheimer's disease as a sort of a case study. And I should preface my comments uh, by saying that I too am a believer, um, but I'm a, a believer wrestling with my faith a little bit. And I think um, we can put our heads together and uh, recognize um, some of the cautionary tales and, and how we can make this approach uh, still more valuable. All right, so for a little bit of an overworked metaphor here, if we think about big data as a big river, there are a few different parameters we can think about. Uh, like a river, uh, big data can be broad. And here, usually, we're talking about massive sample sizes and the uh, hundreds or thousands of subjects. Like a river, uh, big data can be deep. Um, and for imaging, we're usually thinking about multimodal imaging, for example, or imaging that's acquired, as we just saw, with incredibly high spatial uh, or uh, temporal resolution. And uh, like a river, data can be uh, clean or less clean. Uh, and in terms of data purity with imaging, again, uh, we think about uh, imaging modalities with a high signal-to-noise ratio, or that have a high test-retest reliability. Um, and particularly when we think about uh, disease-related imaging, we want imaging that provides really disease-relevant uh, phenotypes. And this is a big caveat in a lot of studies. So the ideal big data set would be broad and deep and clean, but unfortunately, in the real world, most big data sets really meet only one or two of these criteria uh, at once. And a very important caveat is that breadth and depth of data tend to be inversely correlated. And that's something I'll ask you to keep in mind as we go through some uh, particular examples here. So before looking at imaging genetics, let's break it down into the two separate components. Um, imaging, as we've seen, can certainly be big, and I won't uh, bother you with the details here except to point out that a single uh, resting state fMRI data set, which is one of about six or seven that are acquired in each uh, human connectome project subject, can uh, be on the order of two gigabytes in size. Uh, but imaging is also quite noisy. Uh, there are a number of different sources of artifacts. We think about within subject artifacts, between site confounds, uh, among others. And I'll just show you an example. This is a fabulous data set that we're lucky to have access to. It's called the Imogen data set. Uh, this is looking at uh, imaging measures, a whole host of imaging measures, behavioral measures in a large group of about 1,000 14-year-old healthy kids uh, recruited from across Europe. Uh, what we're looking at on the y-axis is a measure of white matter integrity. And you can see that uh, seven of these eight sites have a pretty tight clustering of their uh, mean white matter integrity value. Um, but site number four is a clear statistical outlier, probably due to some sort of uh, hardware difference or artifact. Um, now moving to genetics, as we all know, genetics can be quite big. A single uh, whole genome sequence might, uh, depending on the, the depth at which it's uh, interrogated, range on the order of 200 gigabytes. And like imaging, genetics can also be quite noisy. So we have similar within-subject artifacts, between-site confounds, so different SNP chips or platforms that are used across different sites. Um, and as David Glazer pointed out yesterday, uh, batch effects. So not surprisingly, then, when you combine imaging and genetics, the data get bigger, yes, but they also get noisier. And they can get noisier in uh, some complicated and interacting ways. Um, so one example that, that came to mind, we've been uh, hearing a fair bit about autism these days. There are a lot of big uh, imaging genetic studies of autism. But this becomes problematic because the kids that are sicker and probably bearing a bigger genetic burden are also the kids that are likely to move more in the scanner. So you'll have more movement-related imaging artifacts in those uh, sicker kids. Um, and so these are some of the issues we have to, to think about and work out. Back to this imaging database, another example of where genetics and um, measurement artifacts might interact. I mentioned site four here as being a statistical outlier in terms of the imaging measure. What I didn't point out is that each of these eight different sites is sampled from different uh, regions in Europe, and so each of these has a different genetic background. And when we control for population structure, how that correction uh, interacts with this site-specific imaging confound is, is sort of anybody's guess. So there are a lot of complex issues when you're putting these big uh, databases together. All right, so I'm going to now focus on a few uh, examples in imaging genetics as applied to Alzheimer's disease. So there are sort of two approaches to imaging genetics and Alzheimer's. Um, and the first one that I'll show a couple examples of is something called a, uh, an endophenotype. So the notion is that the clinical diagnosis of Alzheimer's is sort of messy, and wouldn't it be great if we could come up with a more uh, biologically relevant, more objective, uh, more consistent um, proxy for Alzheimer's disease? The hippocampus is the memory uh, center of the brain, and hippocampal atrophy is, is a, a standard finding in Alzheimer's disease patients. And so hippocampal volume has been thought of as an endophenotype uh, for Alzheimer's disease. Uh, 
Uh, and so in this study, uh, the uh, authors, this is really a computational tour de force, um, looked at hippocampal volume across 20,000 subjects' MRI scans, so very broad. But to get a sample size that large, they had to take all comers. So mixed in here are patients with Alzheimer's, schizophrenia patients, healthy young controls, and healthy older controls. This is uh, gathered from about 20 different studies, and many of the uh, studies themselves were multi-site in nature, like the imaging uh, data that I showed you, so they come with problems. I mean, across the 20 studies, there are about 20 different imaging parameters, even for this basic structural MRI um, uh, outcome measure that they were looking at. On the genetics front, uh, they looked at about a million different gene uh, genetic polymorphisms, but here again, uh, these were actually imputed from 10 different uh, SNP chips. And in their model, then, they have to correct, uh, obviously, for some critical variables, variables like age, diagnosis, and scanner site. So at the end of this massive, computationally uh, impressive analysis, what, what was learned? So one polymorphism uh, shown here survived genome-wide significance in, in a meta-analysis here. Um, and that's impressive on the one hand, um, and points to the, the fact that this sort of work can get done in the right hands and can get done well. Um, but the investigators themselves were pretty um, cautious about uh, interpreting these data and thinking about the, the whole endophenotype model. So one thing that's worth pointing out is that this particular polymorphism is intergenic, which is true of, of many GWAS findings. This is actually between uh, uh, a couple genes. It's not in a gene. So biologically, we weren't sure which protein or proteins account uh, for the association between this polymorphism and the hippocampal volume. And then I think more tellingly, this particular polymorphism, the only one that survived significance in this 20,000 subject study, only accounted for 1% uh, of the variance in the volume, so a very small uh, effect size. And to their credit, the authors uh, brought all these, out, uh, all these issues out in their discussion. So uh, broad, but ultimately uh, landing on something that, that doesn't tell us a lot, I don't think, uh, biologically, and, and questioning whether this notion of an endophenotype is really uh, informative in imaging genetics. So let's move to a different uh, study. This is data taken from the Alzheimer's Disease Neuroimaging Initiative. This is a fantastic, publicly available, uh, big data study, about 60 sites in the US and now sort of sprouting out into uh, other nations as well. Uh, these are about now 1,500 subjects, healthy controls, uh, patients with mild cognitive impairment, and patients with Alzheimer's disease that are very deeply phenotyped, all kinds of imaging measures, um, neuropsychological measures, behavioral measures, and then um, genotyped as well. And here, instead of hippocampal volume as an endophenotype for Alzheimer's, the investigators used something called uh, amyloid PET. So when we look at the brain of Alzheimer's patients uh, at postmortem, amyloid deposition is, is rampant, and that's one of the core features of it. People are familiar with beta amyloid and this protein and its, its role in Alzheimer's. What's incredible, though, is that since 2004 now, we're able to get a measure in vivo uh, of a living, uh, healthy control or patient's amyloid burden using a PET scan. And so here, the investigators look using just 500 subjects now, so a much uh, narrower, uh, less broad sample size, focused on amyloid imaging as their endophenotype and did, a, again, a GWAS-based approach, asking if they could find SNPs that were associated with amyloid burden. Here, they co collapsed across controls, MCI patients and Alzheimer's, so they had to factor that diagnosis out of their analysis. Um, but this is a little more telling, I think. So on the uh, far right of the slide, there is a peak that, that survives and well beyond survives uh, genome-wide significance in the APOE region. APOE is the most common genetic risk factor for Alzheimer's disease, and this serves as a sort of a, a validity check for this endophenotype, uh, amyloid imaging. But they also landed on a, another gene uh, on the far left there, BCHE, uh, which survived genome-wide significance. Now, the truth is we'd like to see that gene then uh, sort of borne out in an actual Alzheimer's versus control, uh, clinical case control analysis, and that hasn't happened yet. Um, but I think at least this, this suggests that this approach, uh, you know, the endophenotype approach might work, but you have to pick the right endophenotype, basically. All right, and this is work from the Alzheimer's Prevention Initiative. This is a study of uh, subjects in Colombia that come from a single kindred. There are about 5,000 people in this kindred, many hundreds of whom carry a, a significant risk factor for Alzheimer's disease uh, mutation on the presenilin-1 gene. So here now, just using 50 subjects and looking at amyloid imaging and people that carry this gene as they approached the age of onset for this particular kindred, uh, which is about 45 when people get sick. Um, you can see this sort of accrual of amyloid uh, over time as people approach their uh, expected age of onset here. 
So these people are still healthy now, and as we approach 45, only now uh, do people start to show symptoms. So there's a good 20 years or so of time when people are already accruing amyloid pathology um, but aren't even sick yet. And using this sort of an approach, having a good sense of when people in this kindred are expected to get sick, this API group, uh, led by Eric Ryman and colleagues uh, uh, at the Banner Institute in Arizona, have basically then gone a little deeper and looked at a whole bunch of different modalities in the same kindred of subjects. And here we're going to compare mutation carriers to uh, their relatives that don't carry the mutation, so the, the sort of perfect control data set, across a bunch of different measures. Remember, age 45 here on the, on the x-axis is about when people get sick. This is spinal fluid levels of beta amyloid, showing changes um, from the non-carrier group uh, about 20 years before people get sick. This is the amyloid imaging study I showed you before. Again, about 15 or 20 years before people get sick, the carriers are already showing changes. This is spinal fluid levels of tau, um, around the same time, actually, as the amyloid uh, PET. It starts to change. This is glucose metabolism. Um, and interestingly, that other end of phenotype that I mentioned from the, the large 20,000 subject study, hippocampal volume here shown in green, really doesn't begin to budge away from the non-carriers until about four or five years before patients get sick, right around the time uh, that memory does. So here, we've taken a very small um, but highly um, you know, disease-relevant and deeply phenotyped group uh, and established this sort of a dynamic model. This is incredibly informative, not just when we think about a single patient in the clinic, but more importantly, when we think about um, setting up clinical trials. All right, and then just uh, the last 30 seconds on some work that we've done with the ADNI data set, again, on a very small scale. I, I should point out, I guess, that you know, these examples have gone uh, in descending order from sample size, but I hope uh, in ascending order in terms of uh, the depth of the data and the potential clinical relevance. So these are... Um, from the ADNI data, these are healthy, older APOE4 carriers. We know that APOE increases amyloid in the brain, and that's one of the mechanisms, we think, uh, by which it causes Alzheimer's disease. So we found 10 protected APOE4 carriers. They're older, and with amyloid imaging, they have normal um, uh, or negative amyloid scans. And we can compare rare variants in whole genome sequence data from these 10 protected Alzheimer's, or I'm sorry, healthy controls, uh, compared to amyloid-positive Alzheimer's disease patients. Um, and when we do that, and this is preliminary data, and it's publicly available, so I'll just I'll put this out there, we found two of these protected subjects shared a very rare um, uh, variant, which is predicted to be um, you know, protein-modifying in the untranslated region of the presenilin-1 gene. That's the same gene, different area, but the same gene that's implicated in uh, autosomal dominant Alzheimer's, uh, as in the Columbia kindred. All right, so when we think about big data, I, apologies to any Clevelanders here, I'm from Cleveland. This is the Cuyahoga River. It's broad, it's pretty deep, and at one point it was very uh, dirty, right? This is the Cuyahoga River on fire. Um, but we can learn from this, we can even profit from this um, in, in terms of our, our past mistakes. This is Burning River Ale from the Great Lakes Brewing Company. Um, and as we move forward, obviously, the expectation, and you've seen already two nice examples in our prior talks, is that the data are certainly going to get broader. That's an easy part. And I, my main cautionary note here is I wouldn't be too taken with uh, data that's overly broad but sort of lacks depth and lacks purity. Um, but clearly, from what we've seen in the last two talks, the data are only going to get um, deeper uh, and purer. And I think this is going to help us uh, attack what is one of the biggest uh, healthcare problems uh, that, that we face today. Thanks. <laughs>